Central Arkansas in the studios of Arkansas PBS is Selection 2022, Arkansas PBS U.S. House of Representatives District 4 debate. Stand by Jim in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, up on Jim and Q. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Debate Week here on Arkansas PBS. At this hour, the candidates for Arkansas's 4th Congressional District. They are, in alphabetical order, the Libertarian candidate, Gregory Maxwell, the incumbent and Republican nominee, Bruce Westerman, and the Democratic candidate, John White. The questions for the debate will be coming from Byron Tate of the Pine Bluff Commercial, Christina Munoz of Arkansas PBS and Natural State Update, and I'm Steve Barnes. The rules for the debate have been agreed upon by all the candidates, and they are these. Each nominee will have one minute to respond to questions. The candidates will have 30 seconds for rebuttal if they choose to use it. At the conclusion of questioning, each candidate will have one minute for a closing statement. Now, the order of candidate appearances was determined prior to the debate in a drawing overseen by the candidates or their representatives. Well, with that bit of housekeeping out of the way, it's time to begin. Our first question will be coming from Byron Tate of the Pine Bluff Commercial, and it goes to Mr. Maxwell. Polls show that between 60 and 70 percent of Republicans, many independents, and a handful of Democrats don't believe that Joe Biden was legitimately elected. Do you count yourself among that group, yes or no? And what would you tell those individuals today? No, I don't count myself among those individuals, but I also don't believe in polls. Uh, they're skewed from the mainstream media. We're still searching for the truth, but no. That's Mr. That. Westerman. Well, thank you. Good to be with you, yeah. uh, and uh, Greg and John. And I want to thank Arkansas PBS for uh, hosting these debates. You do such a great job every year. But yes, Joe Biden is the president of the United States. It was certified by the states, uh, and uh, the electors were accepted by Congress. Now, that's not to say there weren't some anomalies in the last election, uh, but there's a curing time after the election up until states certify the election. Uh, every state certified their election results. They were sent to Washington, D.C. And uh, unfortunately, Joe Biden has been the president for the last two years, and we see the results of his, um, his presidency, his bad policies that have got America uh, in a recession. We're seeing increasing food prices and increasing fuel costs. And uh, that's why this midterm election is so important to put the brakes on Joe Biden and his enablers in Congress. Mr. White. Uh, yes, yeah, so it was definitely stolen. We all watched the numbers go from Trump to Biden. I don't believe Biden got more votes than President Obama. But that's just my opinion. I can't prove it. But I would have stood up and I would have said something about it. And that's come from a Democrat because n not a Republican, not a Libertarian, not an Independent, not a Democrat needs to be leading people, be the representatives illegally. We're a nation of laws. A two-tiered system now. This, that's the way most people feel about it. Mr. Maxwell, thank you. Rebuttal time. Or Mr. White, thank you. Mr. Maxwell, rebuttal. 30 yes, seconds. Absolutely. I get a, what, 30 second rebuttal? Cool. Um, Mr. Westerman has the upper hand of being there and experiencing that, uh, outsiders and lay uh, uh, political people don't have that option, don't have that option. We have to take it for, uh, for what we are reported to. And uh, you have the left and you have the right. We are the middle, the libertarians. Rebuttal, Mr. Westerman. 
Well, I'll just say that, again, there's a process. There was a time between the election results and when states certified the elections. There were several uh, questions raised. I even signed on to a, uh, an amicus brief out of the state of Texas and several other states asking the Supreme Court to look at the election results. The Supreme Court's answer was, we're not going to look at this. So the process ran its due course. The state certified their electors. They sent them to Washington, D.C., and Joe Biden's the president. Well, Mr. White, rebuttal. 30 seconds, sir. Good question. You know, at least somebody should have stood up and said, wait a minute, hold up. Maybe we need to send some of these back to the states. Granted, it's up to the legislators to send their representatives, but if they're not the representatives of their state, the only thing I do is look at the county map. Thank you, sir. Our next question comes from uh, Ms. Munoz, and it goes first to Mr. Westerman. Mr. Westerman, thank you. Let's talk about the national debt. The U.S. recently surpassed $31 trillion in debt. What are your thoughts on how much we should be spending and how much debt we should have and how to be sure that our next generation is not negatively impacted by all that debt? Christina, thank you for that question. That's something that uh, seems to be ignored in Washington these days. And the spending in the first two years of the Biden administration has been astronomical and record breaking. If you look at the long term commitments to spending that this administration empowered by a Democrat Congress, it's $10 trillion. Uh, we're reaching the point as interest rates go up where interest on the debt is going to be the number one expenditure of the United States government. Uh, there are five things that drive uh, cost or drive expenditures and debt in this country, and it's all mandatory spending. It's interest on the debt's the first one. Then you've got Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and you've got about 80 uh, social welfare programs. If we really want to tackle uh, the debt, we have to tackle those issues. That's why it's important to pass a budget, to pass appropriation bills, and to stand firm on those appropriation bills. That's a position I've had since I've been in Congress, and I will continue to have it. Mr. White, one minute, sir. Well, I'm with Ms. Westman. We need to pass a budget for the first time, line by line, and explain where our money's going. Washington, D.C., both parties, I don't care, both parties, have been throwing it out the window, printing it, and throwing it out the window like there's no tomorrow. There's a reckoning coming one way or another, and we're all going to get to live through it. I've been apologizing to every college student and younger person I can find for what we're going to leave for them to clean up. There's no explaining that because we can't pay it back. Let's be honest. All right, Mr. Westerman, or excuse me, Mr. Maxwell, to you. Ah, you yes. One minute, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, looking at our, a lot of our uh, line items of what we all believe and, and look at, Okay, we're in line on that. I mean, uh, him having the experience and being there, he can say the right things, but then there are other things uh, that can come into play. And uh, those things are, are hidden from us, and we don't have that opportunity uh, to know the inside track. I'm in the, we're third party now, but we're coming on strong and, and it needs to have us, we need to have a little bit more uh, transparency, a little bit more transparency. Uh, I, I'm done. <laughs> thank you so much. Mr. Maxwell, thank you. Uh, rebuttal time, Mr. Westerman, 30 seconds, sir, if you choose. Well, I think Americans have to ask themselves, what did they get for this uh, huge spending of the past two years? Uh, you know, we, had, we were coming through COVID, uh, and the first thing the Democrats uh, did was pass the, uh, uh, the ARPA bill, uh, which didn't help our economy at all. It actually drove up inflation, and we're paying the price for that now. 
Uh, Mr. Maxwell makes a great point. We need to have more transparency. We don't have transparency right now. With Republicans in the majority, we will have oversight and transparency and get questions answered that haven't been answered the past two years. Mr. White, rebuttal. Oh, yes. Uh, there again, how much money have we thrown at Ukraine in the past six months? More than Afghanistan and Iraq? Why? Nobody wants it. The American people don't want it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Maxwell, 30 seconds for rebuttal if you choose. I'm good. All right, next question then goes first to Mr. White. Uh, sir, the congressman uh, spoke a second ago about the cost of entitlement programs. Sh are we spending too much on Social Security Medicare and Medicaid, should they in some way be means tested, sir? Well, uh, no. The medic, the Social Security Trust Fund has been, there's no other way of putting it besides raped and left full of dust. There's no, you know, hey, it's gonna go bankrupt, let's admit it. And then I have a handicapped son at home myself. I know what it's like to take care of him. I know exactly how expensive it is for health care and everything else. I'm not complaining. But there again, how are you going to fix it? First of all, where are we going to find the $30 trillion and some change? It's not just around the corner. We got to start asking ourselves real hard questions and looking ourselves in the mirror and not worried about getting reelected. Mr. Maxwell, one minute, sir. What was the question again? Are we spending too much on entitlement programs? Should they be capped in some way, sir, or means tested, yes. for example? They should be capped. Entitlement uh, only entitles the entitled. I mean, uh, people have to work. People have gotten out of the habit of working. Uh, sweating, uh, making a product, a good thing with making American products, American products, as opposed to those shipped in from China. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> there's so many things to talk about, and we're a divided nation between the Democrats and the Republicans. We're a divided nation. You've got an opportunity sitting right here on the very end for the middle. And people ought to take that opportunity and see changes made in, in that. Thank you, sir. Mr. Westerman, you have 30, uh, one minute, sir. Uh, we often give the word entitlement kind of a bad connotation, but entitlement means that you're obviously entitled to have something. Medicare and Social Security are programs that people have paid into while they're working. The problem with Medicare and Social Security is uh, both of them are on a path for insolvency. And when we get to that point, the only money that will be available for either Medicare or Social Security are the monies that are being paid in in that given year. So that would mean huge cuts to those programs. So to keep those programs solvent, we have to work on solutions uh, to make them solvent over time. Uh, the whole time I've been in Congress, I keep pushing these issues, but Congress as a whole keeps uh, running the other way from the issues. It's going to come upon us probably in the next five to 10 years and we should be working for solutions. I have a bill called the Fair Care Act where I address uh, Medicare, and I've also signed on to legislation that I think would help fix uh, Social Security. Mr. White, you have 30 seconds for a rebuttal if you choose, sir. Oh, no, the debt's the debt, man. It's like, we gotta come up with a rip, some way to fix it. We all gotta come together. We all gotta sit down the table, talk like adults, have a conversation and figure out how we do not let the children and the next generation and their generation get stuck with everybody's greed and worrying about their seat instead of the people. Thank you, sir. Mr. Maxwell, 30 seconds if you choose. That's okay. Mr. Westerman, 30 seconds. 
Yeah, that was, that's an, a detailed question, so I'll elaborate on it a little bit more as well. Uh, until we focus on these huge problems, mandatory spending makes up 70 to 75 percent of the total spending. Uh, we cannot fix the debt if we don't address mandatory spending programs. That means tough decisions will have to be made, but it also means if we want to keep these programs viable for the future, we have to start addressing them. We should have been addressing them many years ago. Thank you. Our next, our next question comes first, uh, or comes from Mr. Tate, and it goes first to Mr. Maxwell. A majority of Republican nominees on the ballots in state and federal races have denied or questioned the outcome of the last presidential election. That group includes Congressman Rick Crawford, Attorney General Leslie Rutledge, who is running for Lieutenant Governor, and Mr. Westerman, according to an analysis by the Washington Post. With so many election deniers controlling the levers of power, do you fear future elections will be tainted or overturned by those unwilling to accept defeat as Mr. Trump has done? Please explain your answer. Sometimes you got to know to throw, uh, know when to throw in the towel. Um, you're by, just by evidence of you asking that question two years later. I mean, uh, it should be accepted and within two weeks because of the mail-in ballots. And uh, uh, we need safe elections. We need security in our elections, and we need uh, IDs for our elections. People need to have an ID, uh, uh, a voter ID system. Every state needs to have a voter ID uh, to validate your, your, your right to vote here in this great America. I mean, there's no better place to live than America right now aside from the inflation. Of course, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, in a little bit. But uh, back to the votes, we need voter ID, and, and it's a, yeah, time's up. <laughs> Mr. Westerman, one minute, sir. Could you, could you clarify, did you say the Washington Post said I'm an election denier? That's right. <laughs> well, <laughs> the Washington Post needs to check their facts. I voted to certify electors. Uh, I did sign that amicus brief, but it was before the state's certified the results. After the state certified the results, I accepted those and voted for them uh, uh, for Congress. Now, I will say um, there have been Democrats in the past that have voted to not certify elections, and nobody thought anything at all about it. Um, there were people with convictions that thought they, they should vote against certifying the electors, but also the process was a, a representative and a senator had to contest the results. There wasn't a single state where a representative and a senator from that state contested results. Uh, it would be the equivalent of saying Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi contested results in Arkansas and people voted not to accept the Arkansas electors. So I did not, uh, I, so I voted to uh, confirm the electors. Uh, so I don't know where the Washington Post gets their idea that I'm a uh, a denier of the election. Uh, I have to go over to Mr. White now. Sir, you have one minute. Pardon me, sir. My turn. Oh, we're talking about the election again still two years later. I'm with, this all could have been avoided if there wasn't powers involved that we all know that are running it. I don't think Trump was one of the selected few that always get selected. I don't think we voted for a president in a long time. I think the last one that got voted in besides Trump was John F. Kennedy. Who oh, happened to be a Democrat, happened to get killed doing his job for the people. The people that stand up for the people end up hurt, kicked out, or whatever. And that's why it comes out. That's what an average day person thinks about it. I have to call time there, sir. Mr. Maxwell, you have 30 seconds for rebuttal if you choose. Sometimes my rebuttal or response, it's kind of hard to say no response. Uh, and, you know, but anyway, sometimes it's best not to res respond it's best to respond to a no response. So yeah, you know, I had no response on that one. 
I'll let it pass. Mr. Westerman. Well, I know the, uh, the mainstream media and Democrats in Congress want to focus on January 6th, but the American people want to focus on the economy. They want to focus on uh, the higher food prices in the grocery store, the higher prices at the pump, and we've got a winter coming, uh, uh, coming on that could possibly see some really high heating costs across the country. Um, the Washington Post, uh, they, they called me an eco-fascist in one of their articles, so I put very little stock in what the Washington Post writes anyhow. Thank you. And to Mr. White for rebuttal. Okay, uh, could you refresh my memory, please? Mr. Tate? Not here, the Just question, real yeah. quick, we're talking about... Yeah, it's a... I'm sorry, I didn't it's a rebuttal oh, question, a rebuttal? yes, sir. I'm, we're on the rebuttal stage of my last question, correct? Yep. No, I'm good. I'm, That's I'm correct. Good. All right, our next question goes then to, uh, goes to uh, Mr. Westerman. Sir, you've noticed, uh, noted a couple of times uh, in the broadcast that you voted for the amicus brief, uh, the Texas amicus brief. A lot of people would argue that that was, in effect, a reversal. You were voting to overturn uh, the, the election. And you said you wanted to examine the complaints about irregularities and anomalies in the election. Given that none have been found in those four states, or for that matter, anywhere else, do you regret that vote? Would you, have done, would you do it again? No, first off, I didn't vote for an amicus brief. I signed on to it. Or signed on, yes, sir. And this was a question to the Supreme Court to look into election uh, anomalies across a, a lot of different states. The Supreme Court didn't even take it up. So in my mind, the issue was settled when the Supreme Court uh, didn't take it up. Again, that was before the state certified their electors. It was in the time built in the process to question results, to file lawsuits, or to do whatever it is you want to do to question the election. Everybody knows there was a lot of questions about the previous election, but when the Supreme Court wouldn't even hear the suit filed by Texas and the state certified the results, in my mind, that's when, uh, regardless of who you think won, the state certified that Joe Biden won and uh, Congress went through the formality of accepting those, uh, those electors. Mr. White, you have one minute, sir. I'm still back on the election. Oh my God, I've never been so embarrassed to be an American in my life. I'll be embarrassed for one to admit it. Joe Biden has been the worst president. I'm a Democrat. He's been the worst president. Falling upstairs, downstairs. We won't even say what he did when he took, shook the Pope's hand. He hasn't fixed anything. He's got us in a whole bunch of trouble. If we don't look at it honestly, look at ourselves honestly and not get triggered by those Trump words or Biden words. Look at the problems at hand. Like Mr. Westman was saying, we got a cold winter coming up. It's going to get expensive. Food processing plants, 140 something of them burnt down to the ground this year. Refineries catching on fire. It's kind of odd, kind of crazy. Mr. White, you have one minute, sir. <laughs> or Mr. Maxwell, I'm sorry, <laughs> okay. Mr. Maxwell. Uh, well, could you repeat that question again? Well, it's rebuttal, uh, sir. I mean, uh, but it was for, yeah, for his, uh, it was more than designated to Westerman. It, yeah. It, it was the question, the question, sir, involved uh, Mr. Westerman signing on to an amicus right. urging the Supreme Court to review. Well, that's politics. I mean, he, like, he's there. We're here. We've got to take his word for it. And, uh, you know, he wasn't, you know, it, there's, there's so much that uh, uh, we don't know, but we have to take his word for it. He's a politician, right? And so the thing about that is, is there should be more of us. You should have three parties instead of his and hers yours and mine. It should be ours. And the way you do that is introduce a third party. So, here we go. <laughs> Mr. Westerman, now you have 30 seconds to rebuttal. Well, again, the focus of the country is not on January 6th. I know it's the focus of the mainstream media. I know it's the focus of Democrats in Congress. 
Uh, and if I were Joe Biden, I would be running from my record as well and trying to make Trump the focus of this election. Trump is not on the ballot. Uh, the economy, high fuel, pr full, high fuel prices, high food costs, um, the debacle in Afghanistan, the attack on domestic energy, the attack on American jobs, that's what my constituents in the 4th District of Arkansas care about. Mr. White, you have 30 seconds, sir. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, so outrageous. It comes, like, Mr. Westerman, he, he hit the nail. It's the news. They're spreading it. No, and the government. They want us divided. Nobody wants to bring us together. Nobody's even trying to bring anybody together. We need to bring back JFK and Martin Luther King. We gotta come together. We gotta start loving one another like Jesus would like. Mr. Maxwell, you have 30 seconds for rebuttal, sir, if you choose. Uh, Mr. Barnes, what is mainstream media? In the form of a question. That's your answer. <laughs> All right, our next question comes from uh, uh, Ms. Munoz, and it goes to Mr. White. To Mr. White, yes. So in preparation for this debate, we also allowed viewers to submit questions via social media. So this particular question comes from a viewer in Conway County. President Biden has pardoned Americans who served federal time for simple marijuana possession. Do you approve and should states follow suit? Mr. White. Uh, definitely. There's, marijuana is one of those touchy subjects nobody wants to touch, but I'll touch it. Might as well make it legal. It's already legal anyway in half the states. Tax it. And I got an idea, you tax it a little bit more than you tax my cigarettes, because I'm a smoker, and then cut me a little slack on the taxes on the cigarettes. Because yeah, I'm 100% behind legalizing marijuana. As long as you're not sitting on your couch eating Doritos and Oreos all day, and you get out and be a productive member of society. Done. Mr. Maxwell, you have one minute. Okay, uh, yes, that's Biden's shining light. Um, it's not, you know, everyone, everyone uh, like they say, every once, uh, every, every once in a while uh, a squirrel gets a nut, and, honest, and honestly, uh, I think what he did uh, is commendable and should be followed by some more states uh, and uh, relieve some of the pressures in the uh, prison system for simple possession uh, and incarceration for a certain amount. I mean, we're talking ounces, uh, not pounds. I mean, pounds is different. That means you're dealing, you're missing, I mean, you're gonna have to pay taxes. But the thing is, is issue four is on the ballot. It's like a mirror of what's gonna, what Biden is doing. Uh, issue four here in Arkansas. Uh, everybody needs to take a look at, in my opinion. Uh, but yeah, Biden has done good. Yeah, check mark, good for Biden. Uh, Mr. Westerman. So I think this uh, announcement by President Biden is another example of his weakness on crime and law and order. It follows the Democrat platform. Now there's some cases where uh, people probably have some marijuana convictions that need to be looked at on an individual basis. But I wanna look at uh, it, drugs a lot worse than marijuana. Look at what's happening on our southern border with fentanyl. Enough fentanyl comes across our southern border to kill the population of the United States many times over. And the Biden administration has done virtually nothing to stop drug trafficking and human trafficking on our southern border. Uh, as far as marijuana in Arkansas goes, uh, I think this Proposition 4 or Amendment 4 is a bad deal to legalize recreational marijuana. Um, it's not going to do anything to benefit the state. You have to ask yourself, uh, you know, what are the benefits going to be? And I would challenge anybody to tell me what the benefits to the state of Arkansas will be to legalize recreational marijuana. Congressman, thank you. Rebuttal time now. Mr. White, you have 30 seconds if you choose. Okay, yeah. You know, it's like, you want a good reason? Like I said, if you're going to 
smoke a joint or drink a half gallon of whiskey. You know, which one's better for you? You know, that, that it, it, it's just a no-brainer. Get back, tax it, just like you do alcohol. The fentanyl, I'm with him. The meth, oh, I'm with him. The crack, I'm with Westerman. I'm all down with law enforcement cracking down on it, but simple possession for marijuana, like back in when I was growing up, was $20 fine. I have to call it there, sir. Mr. Maxwell, you have 30 seconds for rebuttal, sir. Huh. Now, the Republicans uh, are sending uh, migrants to different uh, sanctuary cities, and, uh, you know, we have a border problem, we have a drug problem. Um, right now, we have a Republican and a Democrat problem. A Republican and a Democrat problem. Uh, they're not... He said, she said again. I'm sorry. There we go. <laughs> Mr. Westerman. Well, Steve, studies have shown that marijuana is a gateway drug. It leads into other uh, drug abuses. We know that the rates of auto accidents are increasing with people being high since marijuana has been legalized in uh, different parts of the country. So again, show me something good that comes from legalizing marijuana. Uh, show me something good uh, that comes from being soft on crime uh, like this administration's been, and then we can have a discussion. But I think the data and the evidence is going to show that that's moving the wrong direction. Our next question comes from Mr. Tate, and it goes first to the Congressman. Women have had a right to an abortion since 1973 under Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court has now overturned Roe. <clears throat> Do you believe a woman has a right to an abortion, yes or no? And would you be willing to codify that right in federal law? I believe a woman has a right to an abortion when the life of the woman is at stake. Uh, I'm very proudly pro-life. I've always been pro-life. I think the Supreme Court decision uh, was a great decision for life. I think we've needlessly uh, killed millions of babies in the United States since Roe was put in place. But just from a legal standpoint, the Supreme Court said the states can make up that decision. The Supreme Court didn't say abortion was illegal. They said states have uh, the right to determine whether abortions can be performed in those states or not. Uh, Arkansas, thankfully, has a law that says that abortions can only be performed when the life of the mother is at hand. But that's where the debate needs to take place is in the state legislature, not in Washington, D.C. I think the Supreme Court uphold, upheld the Constitution. There was never a constitutional right for an abortion, as you hear it said. It was a, uh, a judicial right by a previous decision in the Supreme Court, and I think this court got it right by sending it back to the states. Mr. White, sir, you have one minute. Oh, yeah, the Supreme Court did the right thing. They sent the power back to the states to the Tenth Amendment. Everything not delegated in that Constitution, which I'm running on, is delegated to the states under common law, which was a big... <laughs> you can get into a deep rabbit hole on when they took that away, but it goes back to the Constitution. One, the Supreme Court is not allowed to make law. They're there to interpret law that the Congress decides, passes, the president signs, and they're there to determine if that is constitutional or not. And that's all it comes down to is they don't have, the Supreme Court and nowhere in the Constitution gives them any right to make any law. You can ask Mr. Westman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Maxwell, you have one minute. Yes, I, I, uh... I agree, and I hear a lot of uh, uh, Mr. Westerman's ideas and um, uh, thoughts about it, having states' rights. Uh, however, we yanked 50 years of uh, process out from underneath the people and left them in a lurch. People, okay, uh, men and women are responsible for abortion, not women. Just women, men and women are responsible. It takes two to make an abortion. It's not a, just a one thing deal. Women have to go in and get it, but it takes two to make it. 
So it takes responsibility, uh, more education. Uh, as far as uh, supporting it, yeah, half support it, half, but and half not. We need to take care of the people that were left in the lurch. And that's important because they're hurting. Congressman, you have 30 seconds, sir, for rebuttal if you choose to use it. I would say there were nearly 200 years of precedent behind uh, not allowing abortion in this country before the Supreme Court made the Roe uh, decision. I mean, look at the foundation of our country. Look at what our founders said in the De Declaration of Independence. Said, uh, we're endowed by our, our creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you don't have the right to life, then you don't have any of the other two. So I will always come down on the side of life, protecting life, both early and late in life. All right, sir. And Mr. Maxwell, or Mr. White, excuse me. Wow, well, hey, we all three in agreement. I like that. Um, yeah, this is, the abortion got way out of control. It's like, when the governor of Virginia says they can just, oops, and it's lift through it and lay it over there on the table and let it die, I don't want to have to die and explain that one. That's not on my shoulders. Uh, that's where I stand. Mr. Maxwell. I'm okay. All right, very good. And before we uh, go to our next question, we want to let you know that the candidates will have the opportunity to participate in a press conference individually immediately following the debate. You at home can watch, or rather, you can watch. You can scan the QR code on your screen with your mobile device uh, to watch. So get your phones ready. You'll have that uh, QR code. You'll see it periodically. Uh, throughout the remainder of our debate. Our next question uh, goes first to uh, Mr. Yes, to Mr. White. Uh, sir, if you had to pinpoint three main sources of inflation, what would they be? Ooh, let's see. That goes back to the central banks, fiat money that's not backed by anything but so-called petroleum since Nixon in 1971 when he took us off the gold standard. And way too much printing. It's a printing press. You know, we might as well all be printing the stuff off our printers at home for God's sake. They're just printing, 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 printing. Nobody cares. Everybody just cares about getting reelected. Nobody wants to. I'm only going to do one term, two years. Let's straighten it out, and I'll come back home. A big oak farmer. Mr. Maxwell, one minute, sir. What is that question? If you had to choose, it's been said that, uh, or Mr. Westerman said that uh, government spending or indicated that government spending in his estimation was the primary driver of inflation. If you could choose two others, or what three would you say are? Primary right. drivers of inflation, yeah. Obviously, uh, not enough money. I mean, ga uh, g inflation has hit ga every aspect of American life. The gas, the food, the cost of living. Uh, there, uh, I mean, maybe there's some inside words and, and, and uh, things that I don't understand yet, the inside track. But the bottom line is, is uh, I think it started whenever uh, the Democrats took office. <laughs> that was the driving factor because we didn't have bad inflation then. Mr. Westerman. Mr. Maxwell, exactly right. Inflation started when uh, Joe Biden was sworn in and when Democrat policies went into place. If you look at the definition of inflation, it's the devaluation of money. And when you put too much money supply into the market, you devalue the money. You can't buy as much with the money that you have. And Democrats have continually put more money into the market. Uh, it, the ARPA bill wasn't enough, the Inflation and Jobs Act, and then the so-called inflation 
uh, Reduction Act or in Infrastructure and Jobs Act. They just kept pouring money into an overheated economy, which caused uh, prices to go up. At the same time, they were attacking the supply chain. Joe Biden did it on day one when he canceled the XL Keystone Pipeline. He did it the next week when he said no federal leases for energy exploration and development on federal lands. They've continued to attack domestic supply lines, shutting down mining, shutting down jobs, making our country more dependent on China and other countries, and it's just jacking inflation up. Until we change course, we're gonna to continue to see inflation go up, even with the Fed raising interest rates. Mr. White, you have 30 seconds for rebuttal, sir, if you choose. I'm just gonna give this one for everybody to go research Jekyll Island, 1913. Mr. Maxwell, 30 seconds if you choose, sir. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, he's got the all, he's got all the ten. Uh, uh, Westerman's got the ten dollar words. You know, people have ideas. I, you know, and that's the uh, reaching across the aisle. But the thing is, is uh, yeah, I have to support. I mean, you know, yeah, we're kind of on the same team. But uh, I can say, I got term limits. We got to start some of those too. How about that? <laughs> Mr. Westerman, you have 30 seconds. I'd like to elaborate it on it a little bit more. Energy is fundamental to our economy. We think of high prices at the pump. We think of high heating costs, high electrical costs. Um, but also, natural gas is a key component into nitrogen fertilizer, which is the main ingredient in agriculture. Those prices are through the roof. We're seeing increased input costs to farming. That's why we're seeing double digit inflation rates on food, which hurts people with low incomes and fixed incomes more. As uh, I, I've got a lot of policy, I'll be working on energy uh, issues in the next Congress. And our next question comes from uh, Ms. Munoz and it goes first to Mr. Maxwell. Thank you. Uh, we've talked a lot about the divisiveness in our country right now, and there is another viewer in Pulaski County that wants to know, how will you bring people who you do not agree with to the conversation? In a headlock. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, if you, uh, people are not gonna agree on everything. That's evident at a stoplight, a four-way stop. Um, to get them to, People to uh, see the other side, you've got to go at it uh, with love and a hand out, uh, not a stick and a stone. And uh, yeah, eh, yeah. I, I mean, I get so excited and then I forget the question. <laughs> um, say the Just question. how you plan to bring people who you don't agree with to the conversation. Like I say, love conquers all. I mean, that's all you got to do. I mean, it's a simple equation. Um, Poe said, uh, uh, I forget what he said. <laughs> About, anyway, love, hatred kills love. Hatred kills love is what he said, but not in that order. <laughs> Mr. Westerman, you have uh, one minute, sir. That's a question that needs to be uh, answer today and a question that needs to be uh, more focused on. I think it starts with uh, having the right issue, then you've got to be persuasive and you've got to be persistent. Uh, I've got a bill that I uh, helped write in Congress called the Save Our Sequoias Act. Uh, without getting into too much detail, we've lost 20% of the giant sequoias in the last two years. These are the most iconic trees on the planet. Uh, I went to several Democrat senators and House members and show them the science and the evidence why these trees are dying, what we can do to fix it. I even took a, a, a long trip overseas to be able to visit with them on this. Uh, as a result, we've got a bill that's got 25 Democrat co-sponsors, 25 Republican co-sponsors, and it's endorsed by the Nature Conservancy, the Environmental Defense Fund, and the Save the Redwoods League. If you have the right issue, if the facts are behind you, if you're persuasive and persistent, you can get bipartisan support, even in Congress. Mr. White, one minute, sir. Oh yeah, we have to, I mean, we can't look at the Democrats, we can't look at the Libertarians, we can't look at the D Republicans. It's one big problem. And everybody, the government's the one tearing us apart. And hate to say it, 
the mainstream news, every night you hear something about somebody doing something that's going to trigger somebody. Let's just calm down. Let's start. Use, why don't we just take the good Lord's words and spread love, not hate. Go back to Martin Luther King that was trying to bring us together. Let's go back to JFK that was trying to bring us together monetarily. He signed the executive order putting us back on the silver standard. Too bad he got killed 30 days later. Thank you, sir. It's rebuttal time. Mr. Maxwell, you have 30 seconds, sir, if you choose. Okay, uh, just to, to, to dog tell on what he said uh, about the sequoias, a national treasure. Have you, uh, okay, I'm, a, I'm sure he's seen them and would like to protect them. I know they're in California. Uh, it's a place I don't want to go but that's where they are, and eventually I want to see the redwoods. They need to be protected, and um, I'm glad to see government is trying to do something about protecting some of our natural uh, uh, landmarks. Thank you, sir. Mr. Westerman. Well, you know, in Congress, you, or in, in the national media, you often see the extremes on either side, and people don't realize there are a lot of people in the middle working to try to uh, address the issues that are important to our country. Social media, uh, cable news, a lot of these outlets, uh, they want to have something that's sensational. And I think a lot of the bipartisan work gets overlooked uh, because that doesn't seem to be as newsworthy. Mr. White. Yeah, that comes about, well, you know, the tree thing, that's easily fixed. That's you need to talk to Noah about that, Mr. Westerman, and what they admitted to, and why we have a whole bunch of X's across this state and across a whole lot of other states. And everybody can agree on that. They need to stop. Everybody needs to stop. Everybody needs to calm down. We need to get less laws and get more common sense and less hate. Come on, people. Smile, Jesus loves every one of us. Thank you, sir. Our next question comes from Mr. Tate and it goes first to Mr. White. The January 6th committee, based largely on the testimony of Republicans, has presented the case that President Trump planned and orchestrated the events that led to and caused the January 6th insurrection. Do you believe Mr. Trump was responsible for that event? Why or why not? Who's first? Me? Yes, sir. Oh, here we go again. Let's get off Trump. Let's get off of it. January 6th, I got problems with. I got serious problems with. They, oh, but you can trigger a lot of people with that. But let's trigger some people. Who died at January 6th? I know. I know of two. An Air Force vet shot in the neck, they let the guy off. 63-year-old lady beat to death by a Capitol policeman. Wait a minute, the Capitol policeman that died, he had a stroke. Let's start looking at ourselves, let's start telling the truth, stop spreading lies. Mr. Maxwell, you have one minute, sir. What was the question there again? Um, yeah. The January 6th committee, largely based on the testimony of Republicans, has presented the case that President Trump planned and orchestrated the events that led to and caused the January 6th insurrection. Do you believe Mr. Trump was responsible for that event? Why or no. why not? I, he, wasn't he wasn't responsible for that particular event. The people were responsible and being the people responsible, they were irresponsible. Irresponsible in acting, they were grown men, okay? That was a little insurrection on January 6th. We don't talk about all the uh, 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 pr uh, protest that went on, uh, peaceful protests that erupted with fires the whole year before in many cities. 
people uh, seem to forget about the many fires and the dangers and the fear they felt coming into the election. January 6th was just an outcry of uh, support in the wrong direction. Mr. Westerman. Well, here, here we go again on January 6th when the real issues are uh, the economy and the pain that Americans are feeling across this country because of the bad policies that the Biden administration uh, aided by Democrat control in the House and the Senate. As far as Nancy Pelosi's pet made for TV committee, uh, you know, she disallowed Leader McCarthy from putting people on the committee. First time anything like that's ever been done. Also, we forget that the Justice Department has their own investigation and they do not need a made for TV committee in the House uh, doing their investigation. Uh, this committee has been at the um, behest of Speaker Pelosi the whole time. The Democrats are trying to make it an issue in this election, but believe me, the American people are not nearly as concerned about January 6th as they are about January 20th when Joe Biden became president and started pushing horrible policies and he was aided by uh, the far left in the House and the Senate. Time now for rebuttals if our uh, candidates choose to use it. Mr. White, you have 30 seconds, sir. Yeah, okay. But like I said, January 6th, there was no insurrection. Anybody wants to call that an insurrection or the worst day in American history. <laughs> they need to look back. It was a big demonstration. Hey, I'm a Democrat. You get two million Democrats up there to protest something. <laughs> Antifa, the brown shirts, and the Black Lives Matter might just burn the place down. Tell me that's not true. Y'all three, tell me they didn't do that to Washington, D.C. I have to tell you the time's up, sir. We go now to Mr. Maxwell for rebuttal. I don't have one. Mr. Westerman, 30 seconds. So I was in the Capitol the whole time when this took place. There are no excuses for it. It shouldn't have happened. Uh, it was a riot and it was uh, a bad day in American history. Uh, but it's being looked into. Uh, it was a gift to Pelosi to be able to try to make this uh, an issue from here on out. She's done that. Uh, but I'm telling you, the American people uh, are not concerned about January 6th as much as they are what Democrat policies are doing to this country. Gentlemen, we thank you for your uh, responses and your rebuttals. Time now for closing uh, statements by our three candidates. Uh, and to repeat, uh, the order of closing statements was determined prior to the broadcast with all of the candidates per, uh, uh, participating. Mr. White, you go first, sir. One minute. As yeah, so like I said, my name is John White. I'm just a uh, man of my word and uh, I'm running for Congress for the next generation. I'm trying to save the children. I'm trying to spread the love of Jesus, trying to do good work because if we don't fix this stuff, if we do not come together in the, as a nation, we're going to stay divided. How do you defeat the United States? You divide us. They've been dividing us. It's not the people being divided. It's everybody throwing their two cents in. Why don't government get out of our business and let us live our lives? And I guarantee you, we'll do a lot better job. Mr. White, thank you. Mr. Maxwell, your closing statement, one minute. Or Mr. Westerman, I'm sorry. Yeah. You're next. Thank you. Well, my name is Bruce Westerman. I'm the Congressman for Arkansas's 4th Congressional District. It's been an honor uh, to be able to do that for the past uh, four terms in Congress. Uh, I'm married to Sharon, who I bring that up because today's her birthday. She's teaching school and not watching, but I'm going to wish her a happy birthday anyhow. I currently serve as the ranking member on the House Natural Resources Committee. Should Republicans win the majority, I'll be the chairman of that committee. This committee works on energy issues uh, and it works on a lot of things I'm passionate about, forestry, mining, and, uh, and fishing issues as well as tribal issues. 
You know, Hank Williams Jr. wrote a famous song, and uh, some of the lines in it say, the interest is up and the stock market's down, and you're only going to get mugged if you go downtown. That's Joe Biden's America. Republicans have a solution for it. It starts with transparency, and it ends with good policy. I would appreciate your vote. It's an honor to represent you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Maxwell, you have one minute to close. All right, thank you. It's glad to be here. Gregory Maxwell, the Libertarian candidate for the 4th District U.S. Congress. Uh, you have a choice. You can vote out the incumbents. They've been there. They've had their ch chance. And uh, you want to know about me? I'm at gregmaxwell.net. GregMaxwell.net, my past, my present, my future is on there about all I have uh, political wise. Um, we're the underdogs. You need to go for the third party um, because you have that option. You don't have to complain. Don't vote incumbent. That would be a good idea. My, uh, 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 my uh, campaign is liberty on purpose. Liberty on purpose. Think about that, liberty on purpose. And you have a chance to vote for a new governor, Ricky Harrington Jr., Libertarian. Make that choice this November. Have to end it there. Thank you, sir. We thank uh, all three of our candidates for, again, for their responses and their rebuttals. We are captive to the clock, which tells us that the time for our debate has expired. Now, you can watch uh, the debate and all Arkansas PBS debates on demand at the Arkansas PBS YouTube channel, on the PBS video app, and on our website. The candidates, of course, have the option to participate in a press conference directly following this debate, which will air on uh, YouTube as part of our live stream. Scan the QR code on your screen and start watching on YouTube now. Again, thanks to our candidates for participating and to our panelists. And to all of you, both here at the Reynolds Performance Hall on the UCA campus and at home. Election Day is Tuesday, November 8th. Make your voices heard. Thanks again.